Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this lunchtime webinar that is uh, co-sponsored, co-hosted uh, by NYU's Jordan Center and Columbia University's Harriman Institute. Um, we are uh, also operating with uh, funding from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and this is our Patton and Russia Public Policy uh, speaker series where we aim to bring um, professionals, distinguished professionals from many areas, uh, academics, policy practitioners, analysts, journalists, into dialogue with one another um, to analyze topical issues um, in Russian politics, political economy, and society. Today's topic is Russia and the private sector, um, especially in also the wake of COVID-19 and the challenges associated with opening and reopening. And today's moderation uh, and, and, and the chair of the session is gonna be conducted by my colleague, uh, Josh Tucker. I'm Alex Cooley, by the way, I'm the current director of the Harriman Institute and Josh is the current director of NYU's uh, Jordan Center. So uh, Josh, uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Alex. Thanks all of you for joining us today, spending part of your lunch with us if you're on the East Coast, your breakfast if you're on the West Coast, or, or maybe dinner or uh, dessert with us if you're, if you're in, uh, in Russia or in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg anyway. So it's great to have all of you here uh, today. We have a fantastic lineup of panelists. And without further ado, I'm going to, uh, we're going to begin and get into it. I just want to let you know that if you have questions, for any of the panelists, you can use this as we're using Zoom's webinar format. So you use the Q&A button. Um, and we encourage you to ask questions throughout the, you know, you can type your questions in throughout the presentations. Um, we will be fielding questions for the participants after all the participants have had a chance to discuss. Although if something comes up that's important, important enough for us to interrupt for like clarification point, we can always try to do that. But, um, but do, do feel free to ask questions now. It's not going to interrupt the flow of the speakers or anything like that. Um, and in the interest of flow as well, I'm going to introduce each of our five outstanding panelists uh, in turn. Before doing so, I would like to thank Deji Uf, who's also on here as one of our panelists, who is one of the uh, Jordan Center's inaugural class of postdoctoral fellows. And Deji uh, designed today's panel, came up with the idea for it, and helped uh, select all of the participants on this panel today. And she is participating with us in the webinar, so it's fantastic to have her here too. You'll hear from her when we get to the beginning of the Q&A session. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to begin by introducing Denisa Duvanova, an ex-Jordan Center visiting scholar who is associate professor in the Department of International Relations at Lehigh University. Um, she's the author of Building Business in Post-Communist Russia, East Europe, and Eurasia, Collective Goods, Selective Incentives, and Predatory States, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2013 and which won the Ed Hewitt Book Prize from ACES. Um, her articles have appeared in various publications, including Comparative Politics, British Journal of Political, Scientists, World, World, Political Science, World Development, and the Journal of Comparative Economics. Denisa, take it away. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, today I will be uh, talking about a very interesting development that uh, took place in Russia over the course of the last year, which is not COVID, right? So, uh, you know, COVID is, a, is sort of a worldwide phenomenon, and I have a slide that looks at the sort of the regulatory aspects of COVID um, uh, uh, sort of um, economic policy. But um, I will concentrate, let me start sharing my screen now. Um, I will look at the um, regulatory climate and there had been a very uh, sort of uh, significant development in this area in Russia over the course of the past year, uh, which has a very interesting and provocative uh, 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 pr pr provocative uh, title. They, they christened it uh, regulatory guillotine, right? So uh, in the presidential address uh, in, um, uh, uh, in uh, February uh, 2019, Putin um, addresses the Federal Assembly and announces this new initiative uh, to slash a large number of regulatory procedures that are uh, impeding the development of business, uh, primarily private sector, small, medium-sized businesses are uh, particularly vulnerable to the regulatory oversight and some inefficient ways in which uh, Russian state uh, has uh, done that in the past. So this new initiative calls for a comprehensive review of um, uh, existing regulations. 
And in the course of the last year, the government had done uh, sort of a lot of revisions. And what they did, they actually abolished, they, they slashed over 3,000 um, legal acts. So th this is sort of, it, 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 for those of you who are not familiar with the way um, uh, this, the, the, this naming works in uh, Russian and Russian language, there are a lot of different names uh, to uh, the government laws, bylaws, different orders. So there are ukazy, apostanavlenia, reshenia, zakone. And all of that in uh, sort of in the Russian legal literature is called uh, acts of the government, right? So this is what I will be using today, acts of the, the regulatory acts or regulatory documents. So uh, they, um, um, so the vast majority of those uh, 3,000 um, uh, um, uh, laws that were sort of decommissioned were the so-called direct regulatory acts, that is, the, the, those are the documents that uh, establish the uh, mandatory regulatory requirements on businesses. Uh, so uh, of the review resulted in the retention of over a thousand existing regulations like that, right? And um, as a result of phasing out some of the existing regulations, the government uh, issued uh, 447 new regulations. And this is all in the course of a year, right? So we have this major overhaul of the uh, Russian regulatory state that had happened last year. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so um, the um, in, in the analysis of the federal government of uh, the overall sort of number of mandatory regulations was, in, uh, in, uh, was reduced by one third. So this is the area that I uh, monitored for, um, for a long time now. And I was sort of very curious of what are the possible effects of this. So this is how graphically, this is how that drop in the number of regulatory documents looks like comparing to basically the, the first years of the uh, Russian Federation. We see that um, at this point, if we count all the number of those federal regulatory documents, again, those are just federal level, no provincial level regulations is included in this graph. We see that now Russia stands at about the level it was in um, 2013, okay? So uh, the, 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 this entire graph is just sort of, it uh, um, illustrates the dramatic expansion of the formal aspect of regulatory state function that the country had seen since the uh, since the regulatory reforms, since basically the Kudrin reforms had introduced the laws that created this avalanche, if uh, sort of the avalanche of new uh, bylaws that spelled out the actual mechanisms through which those regulatory sort of new regulatory approach was to be implemented in, in the Russian, by the Russian state. So uh, the, um, when we look at the overall sort of overall productivity of various federal um, government institutions in Russia, and this graph basically records shows the overall over time changes in the number of, um, of, of the document production, the uh, 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 the the output, uh, yearly output of different um, di different uh, branches of government, different uh, uh, state institutions, and we see uh, this the trend that they are becoming overall, the, uh, except for the uh, presidential uh, presidential decrees, we see the overall upward trend. They're becoming more productive in writing uh, laws and bylaws, right? And this productivity had not been actually countered by the regulatory overhaul, the uh, regulatory you know, guillotine. So th that data, the, the last point, actually takes into account all the laws that were uh, that sort of uh, on top of those decommissioned laws, those are sort of the new regulations, new, new norms that were introduced in that period of time, right? 
despite that, so, uh, so uh, if we, if, uh, when, when I said that there is this avalanche of new rulemaking, primarily bylaws, right? If, if we look at the statutory regulation, there hasn't been major changes over time in Russia in terms of the number of statutory regulations that regulate the business activity and overall sort of the, the, uh, the different functions of the government. But there had been sort of a tremendous increase in the number of the uh, of the government level and government ministries and executive and, uh, agency sort of more making production of that uh, of that um, uh, of, of, of that regulatory um, uh, regulatory uh, framework, the formal regulatory uh, sort of corpus that uh, regulates uh, regulates. The interaction between the state and the uh, and the society and the economy. I want to skip to because I'm um, I have two minutes left. Um, just wanted to make uh, a point here that the number of regulatory procedures does not necessarily translate into it's not equivalent to the overall regulatory burden. If we we'll look at the sort of at how extensive sort of if we, uh, this graph breaks it down into into to the total word count, the, how lengthy those regulations are. We see that this, that recent expansion, you know, that the, 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 the hump is not very unique. You know, in the 90s, we saw a lot of very lengthy and very elaborate statutes. All right. So um, the effects of this reform, I want to um, sort of mention some of the positive uh, effects of this reform that I see and a couple of negatives. So one is the, part of this reform is the establishment of the Federal Registry of Mandatory Requirements that might, in the eyes of some uh, people who analyze this, become sort of the, uh, the, the framework to establish sort of um, ex ante constraints on some bureaucratic abuses on corruption. So if the businesses uh, are able to um, access that uh, list of requirements that the federal regulator wants them to follow, they will be sort of, they can have their eyes on some local abuses of the bureaucratic power. When it comes to the negative aspects, and I'm coming to, to the end of my presentation, I see that, um, and this is uh, something that uh, sort of is based on my uh, research, but also it, it, it uh, is echoed throughout the business community and their reaction to the regulated guillotine. So um, change, change in itself leads to uncertainty. And there is a lot of worrying uh, voices uh, around Russia that with this new change and with this um, sort of following what, what appears to be actually the case, the um, federal agencies are issuing a lot of letters explaining how the new uh, regulations, those about 500 of them that were recently implemented, how they are to be rolled out. So there is the uncertainty negatively affects business climate, and we, we know that uh, from previous research. Um, another aspect, thing I wanted to mention, and this is the last one, at this point, it's really hard for me to, uh, to sort of speculate about the effects on the uh, private business entry, uh, on the profitability of the small business sector, on sort of their overall sort of um, uh, over, uh, overall um, sort of outlook on uh, the quality of regulatory environment because COVID complicated everything, right? So for, to, to the point that uh, last year, uh, the half of the planned federal level inspections did not take place because of the quarantine restrictions. Of course, um, um, uh, um, Rishetnikov said that, well, we didn't inspect and nothing bad happens. And now he actually introduces the amendments to the uh, 2019 law there were recent one on this mandatory regulations that would introduce another wave of changes to the way uh, those inspections will be taking place in the future. So this is just sort of my uh, contribution to the, to, to the discussion, to today's discussion of what's going on in the uh, private sector in Russia and sort of what's its position right now. And I will turn it uh, back to you, Josh. 
Wonderful. Thanks so much, Denisa. Um, our next speaker is going to be Simeon uh, Jankov, who's a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, prior to joining the Institute, he was Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of, from, of Bulgaria from 2009 to 2013. And prior to his cabinet appointment, uh, Jankov was the Chief Economist of the Finance and Private Sector Vice Presidency of the World Bank, as well as Senior Director for Development Economics. He is the author of Inside the Euro Crisis, an eyewitness account, and the co-editor of The Great Rebirth, Lessons from the Victory of Capitalism Over Communism, published in 2014, and COVID-19 in, in Developing Economies, published in 2020. Simeon, thanks so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Josh. Um, unlike the previous speaker who gave uh, some of the fundamentals for private sector development in uh, Russia, my comments will be focused more on the last year and COVID, what COVID has brought to the private sector in, uh, in Russia and perhaps what to uh, expect. I would make three, um, uh, three points in that, uh, in that regard. The first point is that when COVID hit, uh, the Russian economy, unlike many of the uh, advanced economies around the world, was already primarily in state-owned hands. So in other words, the parameter for private sector development in Russia, relative not only to the G7 countries, but also the G20 countries, was uh, relatively smaller. And that was uh, an evolution that took place over about uh, 15 or so years and was greatly sped up by the sanctions that were imposed on Russia just uh, uh, a few years ago that resulted basically not only in the energy sector, which was already uh, significantly in state control, but the financial sector, which was not uh, before then, uh, relatively quickly basically um, uh, aggregated into the hands of uh, either state-owned banks or other state-owned state, uh, state -owned institutions. And that resulted in turn in a number of other sectors that previously the private sector was quite prevalent um, to have an expanded role of, uh, of, uh, of the state. So once COVID uh, uh, came, uh, more than half of the Russian economy, some of the estimates are more than 60%, um, was already in state hands. The reason I'm mentioning this is that over the last year, we have seen significant in other countries in the world, uh, advanced economies, as well as uh, emerging economies, we have seen this pattern of uh, larger and larger state intervention, either purely through the financial sector or through different other uh, instruments. So in some sense, Russia could uh, say, see, we told you that uh, the state uh, is good at uh, running some aspects of uh, of uh, the economy and we were there first, uh, so, to, uh, so to speak. I'm not necessarily saying that, uh, that, that, uh, that that was a positive uh, trend in the last 15 years. I'm just pointing out that as of today, if you look around uh, the global economy, there's a march, if you like, towards more um, state uh, uh, activity in the economy, be it uh, directly through taking over failing enterprises or particular sectors of the economy, be it through very large uh, fiscal packages of the type that uh, the United States, uh, the UK and other countries, uh, uh, other countries have. The second point I want to make is that uh, COVID hit uh, globally certainly, but also in Russia, COVID hit disproportionately different parts of um, the economy and in particular the private sector. Uh, as we know around the world, uh, the sectors that were most uh, heavily uh, damaged initially and are still uh, in some um, uh, recovery paths were mostly services sectors where social interaction was, uh, uh, was uh, more prevalent. So tourism, uh, logistics, um, um, a number of the hospitality uh, sectors, entertainment, uh, and so on. The reason I'm mentioning this is that these sectors, or more generally the service uh, share of the economy in Russia, was smaller than uh, before COVID, than again, comparative other uh, economies. Uh, and that's partly because the energy sector and some other related extractive industry sectors in Russia are so prevalent that the service sector was uh, smaller to uh, begin uh, with. But that's also where the private sector is most prevalent, not just in Russia, across, uh, across countries. And that's exactly where the big hit uh, came. So if we look at statistics uh, for the, the past year, the Russian economy overall actually uh, so far has done uh, 
relative to other countries reasonably well. So the um, GDP um, uh, growth last year or rather decline was smaller than many predicted, about three, three and a half uh, percent. But if you look at the uh, service sector, that's where the big, uh, the big hit uh, came. So in some, sec in some sense, uh, uh, the lesson from my second point is that the service, the private uh, sector um, in Russia was small to begin with, and it was mostly prevalent in the services sector, and it's smaller still now because this is precisely the sector that uh, suffered the most uh, during uh, COVID. Now, two more positive points to, um, to finish my, uh, my talk on. Within the services sector, of course, uh, Russia, um, if we take tourism, for example, uh, Russian uh, tourists were the prevalent uh, group of tourists in a number of um, uh, European and not just European destinations. In my own country, for example, uh, Bulgaria, Russians uh, pre-COVID, so the previous year, constituted nearly a third of all, of all tourists. And that basically disappeared overnight. So if you look at uh, uh, the statistics for Russian um, um, tourism over the course of 2020, either because of lockdowns, restrictions, or just fear of, uh, of the pandemic, um, this collapsed, the tourism uh, flow out, out of Russia collapsed by about 80, 85%. So basically Russian stayed home. Now that reduce on the one side, uh, um, some of the economic uh, indicators on the positive side. However, you see that some of this tourism, much like in other countries uh, in the world, redirected domestically. Uh, and you see in a number of areas, traditional uh, areas of uh, tourism within Russia, suddenly the numbers uh, jumped very significantly. Three, four, sometimes tenfold increase in, uh, in domestic tourists. The reason I think this is, uh, this is uh, positive development is that we see from other shocks, if you like, uh, historical shocks, that this tends to stay. Once you have this uh, technology and this memory, if you like, of uh, visiting uh, domestically, this tends to stay. And I think this is already starting to provide in 2021 a boost, a welcome boost, not just to the domestic tourism sector, but a number of other sectors, transport, um, crafts uh, and so on. Uh, and I suspect this year is going to be a record year for uh, domestic tourism in, uh, uh, in uh, Russia. And my final point uh, relates again to, uh, to the sector of services, but more uh, general outside of uh, tourism, logistics, hospitality, and so on, is that in many countries around the world, uh, somewhat um, uh, count uh, intuitively, we saw actually a boom in new business uh, uh, ventures, basically more entrepreneurs than in previous years. Some of my research uh, here in Washington DC is focused precisely on that area. So we could document, for example, that for 2020 relative to 2019, the number of new business startups in the US jumped by nearly 30%. So more new businesses were created during the pandemic than before. Counterintuitive, it has not happened incidentally in previous recessions, US recessions. Why? The answer was going online. Massively both retail, but also many other sectors were going online in uh, the US, which was sort of behind this trend relative to its um, comparators. Russia is not necessarily behind the trend relative to other uh, emerging uh, economies. It has fairly good um, uh, penetration, but we have seen literally in the last three to six months um, the uh, monthly data on uh, new business uh, startups and their sectoral breakdown that something similar is starting to happen in Russia in sectors that previously perhaps were maybe not low tech but lower tech than in some other countries like uh, like China. And this is not just retail again. This is services. This is some. Um, some areas of the economy that you can do hybrid, uh, both uh, online and uh, brick and mortar, if you like. And I think this is a very welcoming development. And Josh, I'll finish with this, because this is exactly where the private sector is. And this is where a lot of the vitality, the high growth productivity that we've seen in many countries around the world during and after previous crisis, um, we see this in the last few months happening in Russia. Maybe it's because of also what Denise just mentioned in her presentation that uh, regulations have been slashed and inspections, and this allows businesses to um, 
to work uh, less uh, encumbered by uh, by the state uh, apparatchiks but something positive is starting to happen uh, out of uh, out of the crisis and we hope this is a more long term phenomenon thank you josh fantastic thank you so much i mean that was super uh, interesting our, our next panelist is Ivan uh, Nechaparenko. Apologies if I, if I botched your last name. I should have asked you that beforehand. That's anyway. about right. <laughs> about right? Okay, all right, close yeah. enough, good. All right. Just about right. All right, Ivan has been <laughs> a reporter uh, with the Moscow Bureau of the New York Times since 2015, uh, covering politics, economics, sports, and culture in Russia and the former Soviet republics. Before working at the Times, uh, he was a correspondent for the Moscow Times, where he covered Moscow's Crimea annexation and the Winter Olympics in Sochi. He's also written for a number of Russian publications, including Sloan and GQ. Uh, born and raised in St. Petersburg, Russia, he spent five years in Canada, earning a bachelor's degree in international relations in French from the University of Calgary, and then moving to London for a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Yvonne? Thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having me today. Uh, as Josh mentioned, I work for a, a global newspaper, the New York Times, and the problem we had a year ago in the Moscow Bureau was that basically the coronavirus story was the same everywhere, and we had to find something that would differentiate Russia from the rest of the world. So we looked at what Russia was doing with regard to the, the lockdown. The lockdown started in, uh, in Russia in March 2020, and we saw that uh, one of the big differences with the uh, uh, the other countries was that um, the Russian state was not offering um, uh, much of any help to businesses that had to shut down. So many businesses, the private sector, which we're discussing today, were screaming and wailing. So what I did is well, I decided to go to St. Petersburg, where uh, private sector has been very visible, much more actually visible than in Moscow, because uh, in Moscow, you have the headquarters of uh, many corporate banks and big banks, big oil corporations, and uh, the, so the city's economy is much more uh, dependent on this. Uh, while in St. Petersburg, the tourist city, you have um, restaurants, hotels, uh, flower shops, and everything. So, And when I went there, um, it was really a very painful scene because the city was empty and many businesses were really, really very... Uh, much affected by the lockdown. Uh, for instance, a flower shop had to, um, a chain of flower shops had to throw away all the flowers or, uh, you know, I went to a hairdressing salon that employed a lot of migrant workers uh, because they were offering their services very cheaply. So they had to fire all the migrant workers and migrant workers had to basically uh, 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 go to the streets because they, they had no money to pay for their rents and they had no way to leave the country. So it was a very, very painful process and people predicted and many analysts uh, predicted that uh, the coronavirus is going to basically ruin the kind of the flourishing private sector, which in economic terms, if you, if you take uh, the whole economy, uh, didn't really contribute much to the GDP, but changed the uh, life in Russia for the better. Uh, uh, over the past decade or so, because everything has been digitalized, the quality of uh, of day-to-day uh, -day services like restaurants or you know beauty salons, uh, gyms, everything has grown up uh, immensely, and uh, people were really worried worried about that, and analysts were really worried. Uh, the basic prediction was that the economy is not going to uh, contract that much because it's so reliant on the, the on the resources and the big corporations. But at the same time, the prediction was that the quality of the economy will uh, deteriorate very much. And the truth was that uh, it didn't really happen. And uh, the businesses, they mainly really had to shut down. According to Sparebank, more than 200,000 uh, private enterprises had to shut down in Russia. But uh, mainly the recovery was also very swift. And uh, one of the reasons why it was very swift was because the government really saw uh, by itself that the lockdown would not do any good to the Russian economy. So the lockdown was lifted uh, already in June, early July, and we didn't really have another lockdown, like full lockdown that uh, other governments uh, had imposed in Britain or in France or, in, or even in the US uh, throughout the year. Uh, Moscow was basically open uh, since uh, July and uh, most enterprises were open uh, apart from museums and theaters. So what basically happened was that, uh, uh, and I'm going to start presenting here now a little bit. Just give me a second. Um, so, uh, yeah, sure. uh, 
So what basically happened is that the economy, as the PV speaker said, contracted only by 3% and it did perform much better than expected. And it was much, it's actually even better than the world on average. The world contracted by 3.5% for Russia contracted by 3%. But the main reason was, uh, again, this overall weakness of the Russian economy, the weakness uh, uh, in the sense that it's so reliant on state enterprises or state-owned enterprises. By some account, up to 70% of the economy is owned by the state or through state-owned companies like Gazprom or Rosneft or Sberbank. Um, Russia, again, is not as reliant on the services industries and, uh, for instance, as, uh, uh, tourism uh, and business services, which uh, includes tourism, uh, uh, only contribute 6.5% to the Russian GDP. And while well, in France, it's 16% and Britain, it's 15.9%. So as a consequence, overall, uh, uh, the real incomes actually went down by 3.5%. But the, if you take the, again, if uh, as the previous speaker has mentioned, the uh, the overall decline in Russia has been going on for uh, for seven years now, and uh, the overall decline has now reached ten point accumulated to ten point six percent. So the downsides are that you know the, what I was saying that yes, it's true that some restaurants had to shut down, some beauty salons, some gyms, and tourism, but there were upsides too. Um, the IT se- sector has, uh, has as though it needed it, it didn't really need it, but. Uh, it, it got another boost uh, in, in 2020. Uh, companies like Yandex, Ozone, or uh, Mail.ru, Ozone had a very um, uh, uh, successful uh, IPO. Yandex uh, has shown record high uh, uh, turnover over the past year. Uh, so the IT sector in Russia is very booming. But the downside is, of course, is that the government is always trying to control the IT sector. Uh, uh, for instance, in, in, um, uh, with Yandex, they've been trying to control its Yandex news service, the Yandex itself, uh, the, the overall ecosystem. Uh, Sparebank has been trying to control it too. So uh, with each of this... Uh, uh, um, upsides that I've listed here, like for instance, retail, uh, X, X5, the biggest uh, retailer in Russia, the turnover went down up by 14.2% because uh, uh, grocery stores were the ones that were open uh, throughout the year. Uh, but at the same time, you have this situation now where the government is trying to control prices for uh, sunflower oil. Putin is really concerned about uh, people getting poor. Uh, so the retailers, they have to have to get this hit uh, uh, because of uh, uh, the Russian government's sensitivity to uh, price control because prices is basically the main political issue in Russia, uh, the main issue that uh, people at large um, uh, are sensitive to. Um, also, one thing I wanted to mention is that this, uh, there was this private investor boom, uh, 4.2 million people opened investment accounts. This is more than over the uh, all years uh, before combined. Uh, and uh, I, this is a very important, I think, a very important uh, development because um, uh, uh, private investors, they invest in Russian companies, they are thinking about the economy, they make conscious decisions, and uh, this uh, kind of makes people more uh, interested in, in a more, um, uh, in a more uh, responsible uh, government policy. Uh, I know I have just a little more time left, but uh, another big thing that I wanted to mention is that if you if you look at the contribution the private sector makes to the Russian economy, you have to realize that actually the share of income that people get from businesses, from doing business in Russia went down from 15.4% in the overall income and the overall pie to, in 2000 to around 6%. And this is actually uh, a very sad number. So the kind of the... The, the contribution the private sector makes to the overall wealth that the country creates has, has diminished quite significantly. And the social subsidies that the government and the people want the government to give them have increased from 14% to 19%. So, and uh, uh, you might think that uh, this all goes down to the fact that, uh, you know, that uh, the Russian government is just trying to make it so that people depend on the government and thus are supportive of the, of the government. But the thing is, what I found is that there are deeply entrenched views uh, in the Russian people about uh, private enterprise, private businesses that really hinder uh, people's attempts to uh, uh, to open the private business. So you can see from this graph, for instance, that people still think, and this was uh, uh, from a poll made by the Levada Center in 2019, that people still think that you cannot become rich uh, remaining honest. Or uh, many people still think that private enterprises are 
uh, are not as efficient as owners as, as state enterprises or people believe that there's insufficient uh, uh, involvement in the Russian economy, the state has should, should increase its involvement in the Russian economy. So all these things are long-term and uh, we saw the, the COVID crisis kind of magnified them, but uh, the truth is that there are very um, fundamental issues that are still um, there and uh, are gonna be there even without Putin, even if he leaves uh, whenever it happens. So um, I tried to make it quick, uh, but hope it was interesting. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ivan. Um, that was great. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Andrei Akala, who's the director of the Institute for Industrial and Market Studies and the International Center for the Study of Institutions and Development at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. He's also a professor in the Higher School of Economics Faculty of Social Sciences, the School of Politics and Government, and the Department of Theory and Practice of Public Administration, as well as a member of the HSC Academic Council. His professional interests include industrial policy, corporate management, political economy in the transition period, state business relations, and public procurement. Andre, it's a pleasure to welcome you back again to the Jordan Center and the Harriman Institute. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, so can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, a little, it's a little quiet. If you could be close. Okay, I will try, yeah. Yeah, that's better. Maybe closer, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, I think in some sense, uh, my presentation will continue uh, all these arguments uh, provided already by um, Simeon and uh, uh, Ivan. So, uh, and uh, I will base my uh, talk here on this uh, project uh, conducted uh, jointly by uh, Higher School of Economics uh, and Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs starting from uh, the summer of last year. The um, overall idea was to um, uh, study um, uh, a number of um, uh, sectors uh, which are important for Russian economy uh, in terms of uh, the impact uh, of uh, pandemic uh, and economic crisis uh, on these sectors. So, um, uh, and um, uh, here you can see uh, the, the list of the sectors. It is really very different. IT, retail, pharmaceuticals, uh, tourism, uh, automobiles, um, uh, chemical industry, and so on. So um, we try to combine uh, some uh, quantitative uh, data from different kinds of um, statistical and analytical reports, both from Russia and abroad, because we try to compare the situation in relevant sex sectors uh, in Russia and also in other countries. And also now qualitative data uh, from uh, in-depth interviews uh, with uh, sectoral associations and firms. Uh, totally, we could um, uh, collect uh, and provide uh, 45 interviews in uh, six sectors. Mm, and here I will present the main results for uh, two sectors. Uh, first one is IT industry uh, as one of potential beneficiaries of recent development and so on. And another one is tourism. Actually, uh, both uh, Simeon and uh, Ivan told already about the sector and I hope I can uh, add something. So, and of course, uh, tourism is uh, interesting because um, uh, it face, uh, faced really huge problems in, uh, in, uh, last year. And uh, at this link, you can see uh, if uh, it will be useful for you uh, more information about this project with some kind of reports and so on. So, so uh, that is some kind of overall picture about uh, Russian IT sector uh, before uh, 2020. Uh, it's uh, necessary to stress that actually in all these sectors, not only in these two, but in all six sectors. Uh, uh, key problems uh, observed uh, during our project uh, were created already before the crisis. So uh, this crisis of 2020 uh, only uh, showed more clearly these uh, problems, no more. So, and uh, at this uh, slide, you can see that on one hand, uh, uh, we could observe uh, quite uh, successful uh, uh, development of this sector uh, before 2014. Uh, with uh, quite a deep uh, decline uh, in terms of turnover um, after Crimea session, uh, international sanctions, and so on and so on. Not only due to uh, sanctions uh, and uh, restrictions uh, uh, access uh, to technologies, capital, uh, partner firms, and so on and so on, but also simply due to uh, devaluation of rubble, quite significant devaluation of rubble in 2015. 
uh, on one hand, uh, uh, it is uh, one of few uh, technological sectors uh, in the Russian economy, uh, but uh, it remains quite small. Uh, it is only about 1% of Russian GDP, uh, comparing to 3% and more in uh, Europe, US, uh, Japan, and so on. Uh, and uh, it is uh, less than 1% one, 1 of global IT uh, industry. Uh, concerning uh, some kind of uh, key factors um, um, uh, defining the development of this uh, sector. Um, first of all, it is small size of uh, national uh, market. And uh, really we need to be integrated in a global market. Yeah? And from this point of view, uh, international sanctions uh, really uh, were uh, quite uh, significant for uh, development of the sector. Uh, second point is about shortage of uh, qualified workers. Mm, on one hand, uh, Russian universities uh, uh, trained a lot of uh, IT specialists uh, according to the formal criteria. But according to all of uh, our interviews, uh, the quality of training at Russian universities is very different. And unfortunately, uh, graduates uh, in the most cases are not satisfied uh, the requirements of uh, top firms, at least. And they need to provide some kind of additional training and so on and so on. Um, there are some problems with uh, weak links between universities and IT business and so on and so on. Also, there is a permanent uh, brain drain, uh, especially after 2014. Uh, and until uh, the summer of 2020, it was not only about some kind of move to Europe and uh, to US, but even about uh, some kind of move of IT specialists to Belarus simply because uh, conditions for doing business uh, in this sector uh, in Belarus uh, till the summer of 2020 were uh, better compared to uh, Russia. Uh, some kind of specificity of uh, investment climate uh, uh, in IT sector or for IT sector in Russia is that on one hand, uh, government uh, play important role for this sector. Uh, and the uh, share of uh, um, uh, government orders uh, for this industry uh, is much higher, uh, not only comparing to Europe uh, and US, but also to comparing, uh, comparing to China, for instance. Yeah? Uh, but the uh, oversight of this governmental demand is uh, uh, excessive control of uh, law enforcement agencies uh, uh, in this sector with idea to uh, uh, limit uh, different kinds of corruption and so on and so on. Unfortunately, without uh, taking into account real consequences of such kind of uh, violent pressure on uh, the business. So here we can see some kind of um, uh, comparison uh, of um, uh, different uh, quarters of uh, last year, uh, according to uh, the assessments of uh, our um, respondents. And here you can see a clear difference between March and April with a very high uncertainty uh, and um, very negative expectations of um, uh, firms, um, uh, sectoral analysis, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, later development, starting from the summer, uh, with much uh, softer uh, consequences uh, and uh, much uh, better um, expectations, and so on and so on. Nevertheless, uh, 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 totally, it was um, um, some kind of decline in this sector. Because, of course, it is not only about um, uh, online conferences and so on, uh, but it is also about uh, large projects um, uh, ordered uh, by um, uh, governmental agencies, uh, by large companies. And uh, many of these projects uh, were uh, frozen uh, in uh, last year. And it was typical not only for Russia, but also for m m many other countries. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, interesting point is that uh, this uh, excessive presence of uh, government uh, in this sector uh, uh, in 2020 uh, played in some sense positive role uh, because uh, after very short July, uh, really about two or three weeks in uh, March and April, uh, government uh, decided to pay uh, all these uh, governmental contracts. Uh, and it was uh, quite important for some kind of stabilization uh, of economic situation in this sector. 
But at the same time, uh, our respondents uh, expected a decline of a government demand in this sector in uh, uh, this year, in 2021, with um, some kind of um, uh, delayed uh, crisis. Uh, of course, uh, there is a number of new drivers for this sector, and you can see uh, them at this slide. But uh, again, uh, if we will talk about some kind of comparison between Russian IT industry and global IT industry, uh, uh, a global market, uh, the impact uh, of this uh, shock of 2020 was much harder. And at the same time, some kind of restructuring uh, was uh, more uh, active because uh, people recognized this event as a real crisis. And uh, at the same time, they recognized also new opportunities and they uh, try to capture these uh, opportunities. And uh, uh, in Russian case, uh, all this um, uh, development uh, and all this uh, impact uh, in some sense was much uh, softer without real shock for this uh, industry. So it is about some kind of uh, overall assessment of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, my interesting point is also in uh, a real increase in communications uh, between uh, business uh, and uh, uh, government uh, after the uh, start of this crisis. And it was typical not only for IT sector, but also for all other sectors, including tourism, uh, pharmaceuticals, and so on and so on. Uh, for uh, IT sector, it was also interesting that, uh, of course, uh, Mishustin, with uh, his uh, huge experience of uh, dig dig digital technologies uh, for uh, tax services and so on and so on, uh, was uh, positive uh, for the future. Uh, and uh, many respondents told it, yeah. But we stress at the same time that uh, already uh, in 2019, uh, some uh, uh, changes of people uh, in uh, Ministry of Communications uh, at uh, middle level led to some kind of uh, um, uh, changes in the policy. Because before, uh, under Medvedev, all these declarations about uh, digital technologies, digitalizations, and so on and so on, were mostly uh, like uh, dig digitalization for digital dig digitalization itself. But uh, starting already from 2019, uh, more people uh, in the government uh, started to talk about uh, digitalization for uh, real purposes, including some kind of uh, uh, improvement of uh, um, uh, public services, uh, increase of um, uh, productivity in uh, real sector, and so on and so on. And so on. But at the same time, again, uh, uh, our respondents uh, told uh, very seriously about another side of this uh, governmental uh, attention and demand and so on, uh, in terms of uh, a real uh, increase of uh, criminal investigations against IT uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, here you can see uh, even some kind of uh, uh, picture from uh, one of uh, Russian websites with some kind of collection of these uh, uh, criminal uh, uh, cases and so on. And I should say that it is uh, in some sense not uh, typical because uh, usually uh, Russian entrepreneurs uh, try to uh, manage such kind of cases uh, uh, informally uh, and um, uh, some kind of uh, collective action, uh, especially after 2014 uh, with some complaints uh, against the activity of um, uh, prosecutors, investigators, and so on and so on, are really uh, not uh, typical. Uh, maybe one more point uh, uh, concerning some kind of uh, attention of government to this sector is about um, uh, a special uh, program of support for IT sector uh, approved for uh, uh, 2021 with significant uh, tax preferences, export promotion for software companies, and so on. And in some sense, it's similar uh, to um, a program uh, realized uh, by Lukashenko uh, starting from uh, early uh, 2010. So now concerning uh, tourism industry, on one hand, uh, it is relatively small, uh, as uh, Ivan told already, and so on. But uh, if you will consider uh, related sectors, uh, including hospitality, um, uh, restaurants, and so on and so on, 
um, uh, it can be about 5% uh, of uh, employment and uh, GDP. Uh, there is uh, three main uh, segments, uh, including domestic tourism, uh, involved tourism, and uh, outbound tourism. Uh, with some kind of distorted, historically distorted structure, with a very high share of uh, outbound uh, tourism. And with a very um, uh, uh, strong underdevelopment of uh, domestic tourism. Uh, there are different uh, reasons for it. Uh, some of them are historical, because uh, 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 Russian middle class uh, from Soviet time uh, preferred uh, to have some vacations, uh, if it's possible, uh, abroad. Yeah. It is some kind of st stereotype and so on especially for uh, people uh, older than 40 and so on. Uh, but of course, there are some um, uh, other reasons, including a very underdeveloped uh, infrastructure with poor quality for uh, domestic and inborn uh, tourism. Uh, here you can see some numbers uh, about the number of places in hotels uh, in Russia, comparing to Sweden, Germany, France, and so on. Also, uh, uh, travel costs uh, for domestic travel is very high. Uh, Russian government, uh, starting from 2000s, uh, tried to initiate uh, some programs of development of tourism, but mostly uh, with uh, declarations, uh, without uh, real incentives, especially at regional level, uh, at the level of regional governments, uh, to provide uh, proper conditions uh, for um, uh, local and regional business uh, and so on. Uh, concerning uh, the uh, impact of um, uh, pandemic, uh, it was really uh, very dramatic, with uh, full stop actually for inborn tourism, uh, with uh, very significant losses for uh, outbound tourism. Uh, it could survive only um, uh, due to uh, uh, a cancel of uh, uh, these restrictions for international travel, especially to uh, Turkey, starting from July and uh, uh, August of um, uh, 2020. Uh, here we can see some numbers, uh, and for instance, in the case of outbound tourism, uh, some expectations is only about uh, thirty percent, comparing to the level of um, uh, 2019, and uh, similar expectations for uh, current year. Uh, concerning domestic tourism, now on one hand, uh, uh, it uh, could demonstrate better performance, simply due to uh, reallocation of uh, demand um, uh, to. Uh, Domestic travel and so on, so on. But it's Ajay, the same. Yeah. Ajay, we're, we're getting we're significantly over time now. So if you could okay. wrap up okay. and make a point on tourism. Yeah. Maybe I will stop here. Yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, two points. Uh, again, uh, here um, uh, our respondents uh, told again about uh, um, uh, some uh, improvement uh, on the side of government in terms of communications uh, with business and in terms of provision of real uh, support for uh, um, uh, companies. And we told that actually it was first time in their history. Uh, at the same time, we are a bit pessimistic uh, about future because we told that uh, yes, uh, uh, in 2020 and maybe 2021, many Russian tourists uh, which traveled before uh, in uh, Turkey, Europe and so on and so on, uh, will uh, uh, have their vacations uh, in Russia. But uh, under conditions of uh, very poor quality uh, of uh, infrastructure and uh, the lack of um, incentives uh, at the level of regional uh, governments and the lack of resources for proper development of uh, uh, touristic infrastructure. Uh, we are a bit pessimistic about uh, future. So maybe I will stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Andre. Um, our final uh, speaker today will be Elena Ledenova, who is a professor in politics and society at the School of Slavonic and East European mm -hmm. Studies at University College London and a founder of the Global Informality Project uh, and the Global Encyclopedia of Informality. 
Uh, her books include Russia's Economy of Favors, Blot, Networking, and Informa Informal Exchange from Cambridge University Press in 1998, How Russia Really Works, Informal Practices in the 1990s from Cornell University Press in 2006, and Can Russia Modernize, Sistema, Power Networks, and Informal Governance from Cambridge University Press in 2013. Currently, she is the pillar leader of the multi-partner anti-corp research project at the uh, .eu. So Elena, if you take over, please. Thank you very much, uh, George. Uh, thank you uh, to all the previous speakers who've done the bulk of the job. I just wanted to um, comment on some of the points that all of you done, but from the perspective of informal practices. And very often they say in a bigger picture, you could not actually um, assess economic history uh, of any period in uh, developmental authoritarianisms if you're not looking at um, the underwater part of the iceberg. In other words, if you're only looking at statistics and the development of formal institutions or regulatory measures, you do not know as to how they actually trickle into the daily operations of business. Just as Denisa has mentioned, you know, uh, with the arrival of the regulatory guillotine, what we see from the informal perspective, from the practices which have been known as Kashmari business, right? To give nightmares to business. What we see, at least anecdotally, um, what research shows um, in the case studies, that the inspections have gone down at least five uh, times down for uh, respondents. And they say that um, it's been really uh, beneficial from, from the business perspective. Um, of course, there will be uncertainty. Of course, there will be a bounce back in uh, the state regulations. However, what we see in terms of informality and um, informal practices that operate at the level of um, systemic forces is that um, systems that used to be blacklisting businesses for inspections, now um, businesses are competing with each other in order to get on a list for systemic support. And that is quite interesting because in Russia traditionally, you know, everything associated with getting on the list is of um, paramount importance. And here we have a um, very interesting um, document when you look at the list of state support for businesses and who actually got on it and whether a majority of those businesses are actually systema backed businesses. So in a way, if I um, answer directly the question that um, has been given to us, which is, you know, um, which businesses uh, succeed, which businesses uh, fail um, since the COVID crisis, I would say that certainly those businesses which are aligned with Sistema, um, they have done well and you could find them on the a list of um, state dotations. Now, um, those um, dotations actually uh, do have um, some companies such as uh, Miratork, for example, which are relatively new and um, have been also supported. But as far as I understand, there is a lot of competition that is taking place um, among businesses to end up on that list. Now, in terms of uh, diversification, it's interesting that um, regime the regime remains uh, not conducive to um, business and the investment. Um, I was very pleased to hear what uh, Ivan said about the private investment numbers, 4. million people opening investment accounts. But, um, you know, in the cases that I look at, um, which in, would involve people in the Forbes list, uh, another list, uh, and their uh, prospects for uh, investment, uh, invest, investing in Russia and abroad now are considered to be both risky. So that is a kind of uncertainty that will um, uh, determine the following um, period. Uh, people report repressed competition, state monopoly, and the low percentage of uh, small and medium enterprises. 
which is still determinant for uh, the development of Russian business. Now, in terms of um, what happens and what's um, of interest in the non-aligned sectors of um, businesses, I would say that small and medium size have really benefited from the lifted inspectorate pressure, um, especially those which actually could go under the radar of Siloviki extortion or cross-border digital or virtual crossover. Um, within the IT sector that Andre has covered comprehensively, I would just add that from um, my cases, uh, the fintech is doing really well. The, um, you have very interesting developments of um, IT sectors associated with the software production for large companies abroad, such as Boeing, for example. Um, again, um, software production of um, antivirus uh, software, for example, has been uh, of interest. And generally, I find that businesses associated with sort of fundamental science have done well under the COVID period. You know, everything associated with, um, you know, uh, vaccines and um, um, IT um, security, at least where I come from in Siberia, that seems to be a very vibrant um, type of um, development around uh, Naukograds or academic towns. So um, there has been a lot of things said about agriculture. I mean, this is something again, you know, I would um, emphasize as a fairly new development, uh, Russia being the leader in grain export um, globally. And also there are prospects for the meat market, uh, certainly uh, oriented uh, east uh, to China, I suppose. And that is something that gives some kind of positive spin on, on, um, on the development in, in um, Russia. As so for the corruption, and here um, I've got a few minutes left, I would say that we've conducted quite a lot of studies in the past in how um, CEOs and business leaders dealing with um, the context of systemic corruption. And I could recommend um, a special issue on innovation and corruption studies of the Slavonic and East European Studies Reviews, um, 95 issue one. But um, here I would say that COVID has brought very interesting uh, developments as well. Crisis read as an opportunity is considered to be as a way to um, manage corruption in the sense of managing human capital, uh, getting rid of people you always wanted to get rid of, um, finding a new um, opportunities associated with the crisis, and this is actually uh, looking quite promising to me. I'm going to stop here and maybe add a bit more in a question time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elena. That was that was fantastic. Um, I'm going to pass over, as I mentioned at the beginning, for our first questions to Deji, who uh, organized, helped us organize this panel and, and brought up the idea for it, and uh, who is, as I mentioned earlier, part of our inaugural cohort of postdoctoral fellows at the Jordan Center for Advanced Study Russia. And Deji is going to take the first two questions. So, Deji. Okay, thank you, Josh, and uh, thanks to the presenters. It's an honor to listen to your insights today as your work has informed and guided mine over the years. I have two questions. Uh, my first question is whether you think the COVID crisis will in any way affect the Russian government's fiscal incentive to support the private sector. In particular, I'm thinking about the fact that in 2020, the federal revenues from the oil and gas sectors have declined due to low prices and decrease in demand. So my question is if you think it would provide any incentive for the government to increase support for private entities in non-oil sectors in order to increase the government's revenues from these sectors and potentially diversify away from oil and gas. Um, the second question is, how do you think the um, upcoming parliamentary election 
may affect the state private sector relationship, if at all. Thank you. Ivan, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can answer. Uh, well, um, the thing that Russia has built, they call it the fortress, you know, the, the, uh, the former finance and deputy Prime Minister Alexei Kudrin, uh, they just, uh, he and his wife, they did a, a documentary just recently uh, about his tenure and about his time in office when he created the stabilization fund, the kind of the, the fund that uh, <clears throat> keeps Russia afloat during all the crisis. And they call it the fortress. So what they have is they see it as a fortress. So for them, the main incentive is not to support as I see it, at least, this is others can debate, but I see it as that their main incentive is to make sure Russia is independent in in any situation, and Russia has enough money uh, in reserves to carry on if uh, the West imposes more sanctions or if oil prices slump. So uh, I think this is the main incentive, and private businesses are really, um, despite of all they say, and they've been saying things about private businesses for. For, for the last two decades. Uh, but in truth, this is not on the top of their agenda. This is what I think. Uh, and the second question was... Um, About the upcoming elections, if you think that... Uh, is well, I think, again, I think uh, uh, the, the thing about the upcoming elections is that the government is... It is much harder for the government to win uh, uh, every uh, next election that they face and what they basically do is now they are trying to uh, tackle the smart voting campaign that uh, has been initiated by Alexei Navalny, the, the campaign where he selects a, an alternative candidate to the pro-government party that has more chances to win. So I think that this is the main uh, concern they are having now. And uh, in terms of private businesses, I don't think this is uh, really a factor here. Denisa? Um, yeah, so I, I uh, will uh, author sort of my thoughts on this. So I think that the COVID um, had not changed fundamentally the uh, sort of the priorities of the government. Uh, so a lot of restrictions imposed in the COVID were actually costly for the businesses, right? So in that sense, uh, all the uh, you know uh, speakers today mentioning that large status sector like uh, state control sector is actually cushioning um, the COVID effect pretty well, right? So they're absorbing those state-owned enterprises are absorbing all the costs associated with uh, with uh, the public health emergency. However, in the private sector, um, you know the lockdown. Um, the, it, it was all it had to be absorbed by those companies, right? So, you know, the government says no employment for a month and they have to pay, pay wages, right? So, I mean, there had been uh, some attempts to, uh, to, to engage with the, with the private sector, the tax breaks, the preferential access to credit and all that kind of stuff. However, I don't think that the government uh, has the instruments to engage with small business at this point, right? Um, even if they, and of course they don't have resources, right? So even if they had resources, there is no instrument to offer all those benefits to the mom and pop shops, right? And those are the ones who are getting close. Um, and when it comes to the political uh, aspect here, I think with the sort of with this uh, intensification of the of the of, of, of the uh, of the problem with how to pay for this, right? With the declining real uh, incomes and everything, um, I'm sort of my expectation that there will be more authoritarian approach to managing the elections. So. Right, I'm going to pick it up uh, from here, and I want to ask a question. Please go ahead and, and continue to send your questions. I want to ask a question about R&D that comes up from some of this chat. Uh, basically, what is the current state of R&D in academic units and research units, uh, as well as innovation units? Alina, you alluded to the fact that there had been some innovation, and actually in scientific-related research, this was uh, blooming or blossoming. Um, and I guess I would like to start with Andre and then come back to you, Alina. Maybe you can give a couple of examples or further thoughts on this. Um, <coughs> has the shutdown, it, uh, Andre, from your viewpoint, has it inspired uh, increased activity or 
uh, are we significantly behind in certain areas uh, because of all of the disruptions? You are talking about research and development, yeah, and technological development, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, in my opinion, uh, um, a recent crisis uh, maybe was not so important from this point of view. And a uh, much uh, broader and stronger impact uh, was provided by the events of 2014. Because exactly after international sanctions, uh, it became clear not only for Russian business, but also for Russian government, that uh, high dependence, high technological dependence uh, of Russian manufacturing industry and even defense industry uh, can be really very risky. Yeah? And for instance, we can observe uh, quite a significant intensification of uh, import substitutions program. And important point is that comparing to previous time period, for instance, comparing to late uh, 2000s, it's, it is on, not only about declarations, it is uh, about some kind of real uh, things, yeah? So uh, from this point of view, for instance, even this situation with um, a quite quick collaboration with um, uh, Sputnik V and so on and so on, maybe can be considered as some of results. But at the same time, it's clear uh, that uh, in terms of uh, technological competition, not only with US, but even with, with China, uh, Russia unfortunately is quite weak. And perhaps in some uh, sectors or maybe even in some subsectors, yeah, it can be success successful in some niches, yeah. But unfortunately no more. And uh, my very far, from, from my point of view, there is no real um, uh, option for um, uh, this uh, isolated fortress uh, like in the uh, time of Soviet Union, it is illusion, yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, I'll leave the same to you. Um, I agree with Andre on the general assessment in the sense that it's too early to say um, what the COVID period has actually produced as a consequence. And it seems to be uh, the same trend as post 2014. So I would uh, consent to that. My understanding of the situation since 2014 is that the size of the economic pie continues to shrink. The more it shrinks, the more internal struggle one could notice uh, for the state support. So if you are interested in you know, whether there are incentives for the state to support businesses, Yes, there are, but there are those which are hijacked to serve informal agendas, whereas Sistema supporting businesses are getting uh, the support. And those I wouldn't uh, recognize as, as state um, incentives. They are just um, informal interests being served by the formal institutions of state. Now, um, in terms of examples of R and D and you know major uh, funding that has gone to support innovation, I would um, cite the latest uh, grant that, for example, uh, Vector has received. This is a Siberian outlet that produces a vaccine which is an alternative to Sputnik and actually alternative to all other existing. Um, vaccines because it's based, as far as I understand, on a radically different technology in comparison to what we have in the world. So that is interesting. And I hear that uh, the state has supported uh, taking it to the production level. There was a pilot series produced, but now it's going to um, a wider production, which I suppose is uh, just one example that have been generated directly by the COVID crisis, which was the question. Thank you. Great, thank you. I uh, would like to bring in uh, Simeon now um, to uh, respond broadly to Chris Osborne's questions. He's got a question about, uh, can Russia's private sector reverse recent trends and grow again within the current political system or is the system by its nature dependent on controlling business activity as much as possible? And of course, one of the many hats and contributions Simeon has made, I don't think we mentioned in his introduction, is founding the Ease of Doing Business Index at the World Bank, the very influential measurement of uh, types and degrees of government interference in economies. So Simeon, I wonder if you had some thoughts about that, about Russia in particular, or 
uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic and government interference sort of more broadly on economic activity? Um, I think that uh, there is, of course, a chance for the private sector to step in. This is why I mentioned that uh, relative to most advanced economies where the share of services is nearly 75% of the economy in Russia, it's less than half. So this nearly quarter of missing, if you like, services typically is taken by private sector businesses because they are the ones who are more nimble, they, they can operate at smaller scale, the government is generally not good at uh, operating service, uh, the majority of service sectors, and maybe COVID provides exactly this push because the technology, Russia does have the, both the online payment technologies as well as other technologies, Yandex was mentioned, other other uh, leading uh, Russian companies. So they certainly have the know-how to uh, enter this uh, services uh, space that at the moment has been essentially underdeveloped, uh, especially if you compare to a um, country like China. This, is, this was my observation that the US is also actually behind in the service sector in terms of online penetration and so on. And we have seen very rapid catch up in the last about nine months of uh, US catching up to China, or at least having the type of uh, dynamics that China had in this space uh, a few years ago. So I think Russia does have the, the, the ability, the uh, know-how, um, both in the financial and in the general technology uh, sector. And this is where private sector can, um, can step. I don't think in this particular sector, um, state intervention uh, is so prohibitive or prevents uh, private uh, initiative. Of course, we do see that if a company becomes too large, uh, and we see this from China as well, uh, not the large, um, uh, the large penalties that were imposed on um, uh, some of the companies literally today or yesterday on Alibaba. So the state does intervene. Uh, but I think Russia has so many good, still good know, know, uh, know how technologies in this uh, sector and good people who can uh, implement them. But I think this is the, uh, this is the future. And I'm actually still hopeful that even in the financial sector where post, uh, as Andre said, uh, post the sanctions, not, uh, not now during COVID, but there was a tightening and basically most of finance became uh, state owned. With new technologies, this is hard to maintain. So, so, so I'm also positive on the financial sector having some uh, openings for the private business. Thank you. Great, Thank, uh, thanks, Simeon. Um, I, I want to point out that in the in the chat, if possible, um, Alina, you've gotten a couple of questions about the the journal article, the, the special issue of the journal that you mentioned. So you can go into the Q and A uh, and play, and if you can answer that question, or else just put it in the chat for the attendees. To put the issue of uh, of that journal because you right, so, uh, Josh, just before you ask your question, I saw Denisa also wants to get in on the last question. I believe is that right, Denisa? Yeah, I was going to go to Denisa anyway. Oh, okay, that's why, that's why I was going to segue into it. But Denisa, go ahead first, and then I'll ask my final question. Right. So uh, maybe it's not uh, sort of an orthodox point of view that I want to express, but I think the, there is such a possible combination of having a statist economy. Right, with a very well functioning uh, and uh, quite sort of uh, quite um, uh, regulatory uh, mechanism for the development of small business sector. Right, so I think that um, th this the, actually the recent wave of reforms in that uh, sector su uh, suggests that. Um, the Russian government is doing this not to satisfy the expectations of the foreign development institutions or the foreign investors, right? So we are in a stage of inward looking uh, sort of economic policy, and they're doing something in order to clean up the regulatory practices that they use in order to collect taxes, in order to allow the sort of businesses open and get their licenses for operating. So I think there is such a combination where at the same time we can see sort of greater state control of the commanding heights of the economy, but allowing the small uh, sort of very small and medium sized uh, business operate um, and I think ultimately it boils down to the question whether the state withdraws the license that it had given in the past to the, uh, to, to the government agencies 
to prey upon that sector, right? So that, that is sort of my hope that this recent wave of reform is the reversal of the previous policy in which the state basically uh, g gives this sector as the sort of as the grazing ground for, for, the, for the state bureaucracy. So Denise, that lays perfectly into my final question, which I'm hoping you, Yvonne, and then anyone else who wants to draw in on this. So, I, so when we think about these things from political economy standpoints, we always think about winners and losers from these different actions, right? So obviously it sounds like if there is a move to restrict um, the, li I like the way you put it there, restrict the license of sort of lower level government officials to prey on some of the, um, on some parts of the smaller parts of the Russian economy here, um, what's the likely reaction to that? Is there, you know, is that to the extent that we think of some of that as income supplements for lower level bureaucrats, do, are we likely to see resistance from the bureaucracy? Are we likely to see, um, are we likely to see situations where the regulations are changed a little bit in principle? And, and to what extent does the sort of central organs of the state that are trying to direct these reforms, to what extent do they have the capacity at this point to make sure that those reforms are implemented in that regard? And we've heard a lot about Moscow and St. Petersburg, but what about outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg? And Ivan, I'd be in particular interested in your take on from the perspective of, you know, from, from what you're hearing as well about small and medium business owners, are they more optimistic that there's gonna be less interference or is it likely to be business as usual? But Denisa, to you first, to sort of follow up on the implications from your original talk, from your original presentation. All right, so, you know, two problems, as you, uh, Josh, as you suggested, the bureaucracy fights back, right? So they don't want this to, to get uh, taken away from them. Um, and uh, another uh, one is whether there is anything that they can do that the state can do at this point that will turn the things around for the small business sector, right? So whether it will be enough, right? So on bureaucracy fighting back, I think uh, sort of the changes uh, in the sort of the availability of oil rents that the the, the, the uh, state policy uh, uh, makers they are now in a different uh, environment, right? So that might in itself again this is a political survival strategy right this in itself might prioritize the provision of collective goods right so it might no longer this the previous strategy of sort of the overall growth of incomes make it safe to sort of to, to reward your uh, bureaucracy with this license to pray right because otherwise the the you know the the pie is expanding and people will support the uh, regime anyways right but now maybe maybe the situation is different right M maybe now it is more important to create sort of the the sense that the uh, higher uh, authorities that the federal authority is on the people's side not on the bureaucrat side um so and uh sort of the other uh part of the question whether it is uh, sort of that kind of incremental or you know that 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 kind of pro of approach of uh, can can do anything at this point because we know that the for for decades uh, we haven't seen uh, the the promise of uh, expansion in the uh, private sector realize whether it will be different this time around. This is a different question. Uh, we have seen uh, a lot of evidence that the raw uh, sectors in the Russian economy that can ten, uh, can, uh, that potentially can grow, and we know that uh, the raw uh, sort of examples of uh, new technology, adaptation technology. I mean, the Russian uh, artificial intellect is much better than uh, Alexa, right? Uh, so you know, like you have those pockets of uh, great successes in the private uh, businesses. And, you know, I just want to be optimistic and hopeful that changes in the sort of in the uh, cost benefit analysis on the part of the uh, elites will put more preference on the provision of the public goods and away from sort of using the state apparatus as a, uh, as a sort of clientelistic this way to, to, to support their, their cronies. Thanks, Denise. Ivan? Yeah, well, um, the thing about uh, today's Russia is that it is uh, a fundamentally uncompetitive, uh, it has a fundamentally uncompetitive political system. And this uncompetitiveness, it translates into other spheres as well. So when the government is trying to 
slash regulations, for instance, of course, the government doesn't want people to steal, doesn't want uh, government, uh, low level government officials to steal, or bureaucrats to steal, police officers to steal. So they're trying to fight that with various means, with slashing regulations or with d- digitalizing various things. For instance, in Moscow or in other cities, you have uh, more cameras than uh, in, in many other places in Europe, maybe even in London. Uh, because the government wants to optimize the process. Uh, but at the same time, when you when the system is fundamentally uncompetitive, when you don't have political parties, when you don't have um, a vibrant political system, still uh, corruption and uh, the informal practices that Dr. Lidinova has been uh, uh, exploring for, uh, so, so well for so long, they still, they, they, they ooze in, they, 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 they penetrate the system anyway. And... Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if you talk about the Russian regions, you ask about the regions and whether it's just Moscow and St. Petersburg. No, it isn't just Moscow and St. Petersburg. In other cities, you can see many examples of very vibrant businesses, especially, for instance, Yekaterinburg, um, which turned into this hub for, for instance, for Russian fashion. We have uh, Russian fashion companies, uh, smaller and bigger ones. And uh, the, the, this is a big change. And the, the big change is also in people's attitudes because it used to be that people won't buy anything Russian. Now people buy Russian stuff. And uh, this is something that is changing too and will be changing with the new generation coming. Hopefully we'll see more tolerance to uh, Russian businesses. But the usual thing that people say about Russia is that you know you can uh, Russia is, can be excellent in doing one thing, like sending a, a man into space, which, is, which happened 60 years ago. Uh, on this day, but when you come to scaling it up, uh, you know, you have problems. So unfortunately, we haven't tackled this problem in our country yet. Do we, yes, Elena. I just wanted to continue on, on that thought um, from, from Yvonne and suggest another kind of anecdotal suggestion that everything uh, happens dramatically in Russia every five, 10 years, but fundamentally over 200 years, nothing changes a lot. So that's a citation from Saltykov Shedrin, but actually it has something to do with those systemic forces that actually um, block the uh, and limit the market forces in Russia. So in a way, with what we said already as a lack of competitiveness, a low share of small and medium sized businesses, a low investment, they are all indicators of the systemic problem of governance. And uh, I was asked, what are the forces behind the you know, state um, regulator or guillotine or who could have been facilitating these uh, changes that might be conducive to businesses. I just wanted to say that um, in a recent report on Russian economic growth um, that was produced by Kudrin, um, they uh, looked into the dynamics of Russian economic growth between 2008 and 2018 Andre might correct me with more precise figures, but what they said that the global uh, rate within that 10 years period has been 31% growth. Uh, China has been 111% growth and Russia was 8% growth, which just emphasizes what Ivan just said. You know, we, we do not really have that economy of scale, so we could be brilliant. Um, in, in certain uh, dimensions of it. But interestingly, um, Kudrin has also run a working group on the diminishing uh, regulatory pressure and the pressure of inspections uh, on businesses. So maybe what we are seeing now have been precipitated by the workings of that working group. Thanks, Elena. We're almost at time. Andre, did you have any last words you wanted to add on this? So maybe not already, thank you. Okay, well then let, please join me in thanking all of our panelists. Simeon had to drop, drop out a minute early, but thanking all of our panelists for a super interesting presentation. I learned a ton today and uh, really, really enjoyed all the presentations. Thanks all of you for spending some of your time with the Jordan Center and the Harriman Institute here for our New York City Russia Public Policy Series. Um, and we also wanna thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which funds these series uh, as always for their support. 
Um, and we will, we want to welcome all of, or not welcome, but we want to let all of you know our next uh, New York City Russia Public Policy Series will be at the same time a month from now on May 10th and will be on frozen conflicts. So we'll look forward to seeing many of you back then. We want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, everybody. On behalf Thanks, of everyone. Take thanks care. Bye-bye.